Now for today's program. Harry Castleman is a lawyer specializing in business, real estate, probate, and intellectual property law in Boston. He has co-authored nine popular culture books with Walter Podrozhek, focusing on the history of television and the Beatles. He previously worked as a media producer for the Democratic National Committee, press secretary for the Florida Democratic Party, and as a media consultant to political campaigns, both nationally and in Florida. Harry has been a guest lecturer on TV history at Boston University's College of Communication and has been interviewed on radio and television stations concerning television and music history. Walter J. Prodrojic is a respected television historian, analyst, and media planner. He is an adjunct lecturer at the Department of Communication at the University of Illinois at Chicago, where he has taught courses on, the future, TV, on future TV, television history, and the intersection of mass media and politics. Walter has experienced firsthand history in the making, handling media logistics at such high profile events as the Democratic Party's quadrennial presidential nominating conventions and as part of both inaugurals of President Bill Clinton. Walter is co-author of 10 books, nine of them with Harry Castleman, including the television history watching TV. Walter was among the on-camera expert voices in the CNN Decades miniseries, the 90s and the 2000s. He is a member of the Board of Directors of the Library of American Broadcasting Foundation and serves as a television curator at the Museum of Broadcast Communications in Chicago. Walter was co-author of the article about curating the Beatles legacy for the 2022 premiere issue of the Journal of Beatles Studies from Liverpool University Press. Please welcome Harry Castleman and Walter Prodrojic. Well, thank you very much. We're very happy to be here. I'm Walter Kudrajic. I'm Harry Castleman. And we thought that we would start by, first of all, explaining what is this Hogan's Heroes? <laughs> now, the, it may seem to anyone who grew up watching television in the 1960s, that was just a hit show. But it is important for us to sort of lay the groundwork of what we're going to be talking about, because we're going to be going before it and after it. Essentially, Hogan's Heroes was an American television sitcom. It began in September of 1965, ran for six seasons on CBS television in prime time, uh, running through uh, 1971. It was 168 episodes set in a German prisoner of war camp. Have to emphasize, prisoner of war camp, not a concentration camp. Prisoner of War Camp during World War II, uh, they say in the first episode, 1942. Starred Bob Crane as Colonel Robert Hogan, senior uh, officer among the prisoners. Werner Klemper as Commandant Wilhelm Klink, not so ably assisted by Sergeant Schultz, played by John Banner. Hogan was very ably as assisted by his expert crew, multi-ethnic, supremely talented. So in one way, Hogan's Heroes was about a series about a successful allied underground operation taking place behind enemy lines in a German prisoner of war camp. The stories, though, happen to be told in the form of a situation comedy. Now, a war setting played for laughs along with the espionage? How did that even come to be? Well, actually, as we're going to demonstrate, it didn't come out of nowhere. That territory had already been explored going back to the war years themselves. But more immediately before Hogan, during the 1950s and into the 1960s, U.S. pop culture had woven war story heroics into feature films and on stage. And it's on stage where our journey begins. Well, of course, uh, war themes have been uh, popular in plays, movies, books, radio uh, forever. Um, but the specific beginning, if you will, of Hogan's Heroes begins with two real life American POWs. Uh, this is, you go back to um, uh, the, uh, hmm, Miss, missing their names here. Uh, let's see, here we go. Um, these uh, Donald Bevan and Edmund Trzinski. They were U.S. Air Force soldiers who were both shot down during World War II 
in Germany. And they were in a POW camp called Stalag 17B. And they became friends. After the war, when they came back to the US, they decided to write a play about their exploits. And so they put together a play called Stalag 17. And it ran on Broadway for over a year, 472 performances. Uh, it was even directed by Jose Ferrer. You may recall him from his Hollywood days. And the play did pretty well. Well, as is commonly the case, you have a hit play, you decide to make it into a movie. And so it was. It was turned into a film called, same thing, Stalag 17. Uh, and it was made in 52. The producer, director, co-writer, everything, was Billy Wilder. You may recall him, a famous film director in Hollywood, Double Indemnity, Last Weekend. Billy Wilder was Jewish. Billy Wilder was born in 1906 in what is now Poland. Started working professionally in Berlin during the Weimar Republic days. Uh, after the uh, coming to power of Hitler in 33, he moves first to Paris, then to Hollywood. But he still had connections with the continent. Uh, as it turns out, his mother, his grandmother, and several other members of his family uh, died in the concentration camps. So he had a connection with, uh, with Germany and the war. And, uh, but the film, he co-wrote the film script, and apparently the, the script was changed quite a bit from the play that had been in Hollywood. The film focuses on POW Barracks 4, in which all the people in that barracks are Americans. There are two Jewish characters in that barracks, uh, and they are played by the only two holdovers from the Broadway play. There is Robert Strauss, who plays Animal Kuzawa in the film, and Harvey Lembeck, who later people from the later 50s will recall from the Sergeant Bilko TV series. Uh, Harvey Lembeck plays uh, Harry Shapiro. Uh, uh, Kuzawa and Shapiro are the two barracks clowns, if you will. The um, immediate supervisor of the POWs is the jovial Sergeant Schultz. Sounds familiar played by Siegfried Ruhmann, who actually, uh, well, had had uh, some time in Hollywood playing the comic foil in three different Marx Brothers movies. The very stern camp commandant, Colonel von Scherbach, is played by Otto Preminger, also Jewish, born in the Ukraine, 1905, um, started working professionally in, uh, in, in theater in Vienna and began a film career there moves to Hollywood in 35, becomes a famous film producer, director. He's probably best known for Anatomy of a Murder and Advice and Consent. I came across a great comment on Preminger while I was doing research for this, in which somebody said, yeah, Preminger really wasn't acting in his role as the commandant. He really was that dictatorial and imperious in real life, as a number of the actors and actresses who worked on films of his can attest to. Um, the film is a drama, but it has comedic tones to it. Uh, the basic plot is about a failed escape plot. After all, what do POWs work on while they're there other than trying to escape? But the escape plot fails. And the big question is who was the informant among the guys in the barracks? Anyway, the film was filmed in 52, but the release was held up until mid 53, just as the Korean War was finally ending and the US POWs in Korea were finally being released. Um, the film was nominated for three Academy Awards, only one win that was for William Holden as best actor. But this was a very successful film. And, and so you've got in the popular mind, the concept of a POW camp in the middle of Nazi Germany during World War II and the comedy and drama that can come with it. And that is a theme that was well worth pursuing. And so they pick up the theme, Hollywood does, when they were adapting yet another book that uh, told the story. This was a book by uh, Paul Brickhill, 
It was a nonfiction book called The Great Escape. Again, number one task uh, for anybody who's incarcerated in a prisoner of war camp. Uh, now, that was a firsthand account about British uh, Commonwealth prisoners of war. Well, if it's a Hollywood movie, you know there's going to be an emphasis on Hollywood American actors. Uh, and it, it was a, a regular who's who of the era. Uh, the era. You had the likes of uh, Steve McQueen and James Garner um, in there. But the, the key to uh, starting to tie this into where we're going afterwards is it's the great escape. And it played on the fascination with, well, could you escape? Is it possible to escape? And and the setup is is pretty daunting. Uh, there's a it's a, they're in a specially built new camp, and the commandant says there will be no escapes from this camp, uh, very very firmly. And of course, so the premise is about 250 prisoners are going to try to spring out. Now the with the likes of Steve McQueen, James Garner, James Coburn, uh, Richard Attenborough, you have plenty of star power or people, uh, performers who are very charismatic in their particular roles. Um, and you see the, the beginning of how this works because they demonstrate how you can make something out of nothing. Uh, James Coburn plays the technical whiz. If you need something that could magically act like a pump or whatever, he'll figure out how to do it. And they, what they're doing is they actually tunnel out. There is a, a complicated tunnel uh, conveyor system of make, just digging their way out from under and popping up uh, outside of the uh, camp walls. It was a feature film, not first to play, and now we come to the, of course, the uh, Jewish connection is the uh, Mirish Production Company, brothers Walter uh, uh, Mirish and Marvin and Harold were the producers of The uh, the Great Escape. Uh, they also did such films as uh, the Wichita and Annapolis Story, Invasion of the Body Snatchers, things like that. So there, there was good Hollywood credibility in, in their approach to the story. And it was very carefully crafted so that everyone didn't have to escape. Spoiler alert, most don't. Uh, but the approach was you identified with how the characters in that prisoner of war camp could at least attempt to uh, escape. And more important, the premise behind that was they could attempt this because the fatal flaw of the, the German commandant and the hierarchy in general was a certain sense of smug superiority. And that was their ultimate vulnerability. They can be tricked on some common things, little things. I need to acquire something that'll serve as a uh, shovel. I need to acquire something uh, that, that will, 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 uh, will help us um, get our, our folks together and uh, come through this trap door and uh, go through the, uh, use a rope to, to pull the conveyor through. We need to get all that and we could do it right under their very noses because they don't expect us to be able to think like that. They don't, they think they're smarter than we are. And ultimately that's how we're able to um, overcome them. So you take that delightful premise from a viewer's uh, perspective of uh, these folks are pretty smart uh, in, in outwitting their captors. And you turn it into a hook for a TV series. And why would you even still, why would you consider something like that as a TV series? Because The Great Escape in 1963 was one of the highest grossing films released that year, it, it took in 11.7 million, which sounds like, oh, big deal. You translate that to today, and it would be like 107 million uh, in today's dollars. And so you have the premise of, let's figure out how to do something like this, not something we could be sued for and, and therefore have to pay royalties or successfully sued for. Um, and the twist for Hogan's Heroes and it's such a basic elevator pitch. As soon as you hear it, you go, what a great idea. They're not trying to escape. 
they can do more to aid the allied cause because in effect, they have a mini Pentagon beneath Stalag 13. Stalag 13, by the way, if Mel Brooks were part of this discussion, would say, well, you know, it's a comedy because 13 is a funny number. 17 is not funny. Stalag 13, that's funny. And so their setup is at Stalag 13, they, from episode one, you see exactly how they do it. And they have the guard dogs trained. So the guard dogs take the commands from the prisoners. They have uh, wired the, uh, the barbed wire fence. So it's more like a set of blinds. So you pull this lever and it just rises. You slip under it and drop it back down. They have an elaborate tunnel system, a good communication system. They bug the commandant's office. They know everything that's going on. And it goes back to what are they trying to do then? They're trying to disrupt the enemy from within. You know, I mean, it. Hogan's Heroes is, is simply a sitcom. It's it's not a great television show. It's uh, and it, the the premise, as Wally explained it, is you know clearly uh, unrealistic and and outrageous. But it's a sitcom. I mean, look at other sitcom. I mean, it's running at the same time as Bewitched, where you've got you know a, a, the man discovers that his wife is a witch who can do magic tricks. I mean, it it fits right into that kind of situation, and. It's, but it does follow up on Stalag 17 and The Great Escape. So you've got the viewing public is primed to accept the concept of a allied prisoner of war camp in Germany during World War II and the things that can happen. And so they take that concept and they twist it out of shape and stretch it beyond recognition and and have fun with it. And that's, that's what it was. Um, the the series, I mean, we're we're focusing on the Jews of Hogan's Heroes because there are a lot of Jews involved in this series, both behind the camera and in front of the camera. Um, the series was co-created by two Jews, Bernard Fine and Albert Ruddy. Uh, came across a great interview with Albert Ruddy talking about how this was like only the second real project he had worked on. And he kind of knew an agent and kind of told him the concept. And the guy said, huh, that's interesting. Let me get back to you. And the guy calls him back the next day. He says, you want to meet with Bill Paley tomorrow? <laughs> and Ruddy goes, uh, uh, yeah, sure. And so he shows up at CBS and meets with Bill Paley, who's the owner of CBS, pitches the idea to Paley and the other CBS executives. And, you know, there's this pause after he explains what the show is. And Paley said, well, you know, at first I didn't think I was going to go for it. I didn't think I'd like the idea, but, you know, I think it could work. And and it does. I mean, the, the show was produced by a Jew, uh, Edward Feldman, um, among the directors of the series in the early days uh, included Gene Reynolds, uh, who was born Gene Reynolds Blumenthal, who you may have heard more as co-creator of MASH, who also wrote and directed many episodes of MASH, and also Howard Morris, one of my favorite TV people from the 50s and 60s, also Jewish, very multi-talented character actor from Sid Caesar's Your Show of Shows, Turns out Howard Morris had met Werner Klemperer, uh, who plays Colonel Klink, uh, when they had both served in the U.S. Army Special Services Unit in World War II. Um, the, the pilot uh, episode was directed by a guy named Robert Butler, who was not Jewish, as best as I can tell, but he was a Hollywood veteran who directed the pilots of Batman, Star Trek, Remington Steel, Hill Street Blues, and there was a came across a great interview uh, of him talking about the, the problems of directing that pilot, because he said, you know, this was not like doing I Love Lucy or the Dick Van Dyke show. You had to create a, a camp, a POW camp with, you know, uh, trucks and guards and gates and all these kind of things. And it, it was, it was hard to do, uh, but they, they did it well. Um, the pilot, interestingly enough, which was shot in early 1965, is the only episode in black and white. 
Um, it, it, it was only in the mid, uh, later on in 65, that CBS decided they were gonna go all in on color. If you remember, of course, TV had been black and white in the 50s. NBC had been pushing toward color, but CBS and ABC were slow in joining. But eventually they do. And so CBS suddenly says, okay, we're gonna do all of our shows in the fall of 65 in color. So that when they accepted the pilot, gave it a go to do as a series, they started filming in color. But the pilot, which is a little hard to find these days, is in black and white. Um, they they toned it down a little bit from the pilot. I mean, they they really went over the top in the pilot. They have the the prisoners of war and that in their below ground bunkers. They've got like a steam bath and other things, and they kind of eased that back a little bit in the regular series. A couple of changes in cast members and so forth. But uh, in it, it, it was a successful show. It In that first season, it was the number nine show for the season. So it was a hit and lasted many years. In fact, it lasted uh, six seasons. And when when you look at how they told that story, the striking aspect is, to underscore Harry's point about it's a sitcom, is if you see one episode of Hogan's Heroes, you've seen every episode of Hogan's Heroes. But that's not bad. That's what you did when you created a sitcom in the 50s and 60s. There was no over arc, there was no story arc. There was no how did this, there was no behind the scenes. Yes, you had this sense of, yes, these characters have gotten to know each other. There might be some references by the Germans, et cetera, to past encounters. But the fact is, um, for the set, for instance, they, it always looked like there was snow on the ground, yes. uh, snow on the building roofs. And, and the producers explained, that's so we can run them in any order. It's, it's, it's always that wintry atmosphere for the uh, the prisoners of war, and just like we're... just like in all ca most California films, uh, TV shows, it's always summer because exactly. it's always beautiful. They don't have to worry about that. And, and also, one more thing about the context of the times: uh, the when Hogan's Heroes came on, it aired after the Wild Wild West. Talk about a unbelievable premise a science fiction spy gadgets look at the old west then you have hogan's heroes and then you have a fantasy in its own way gomer pile usmc and so basically um, we, we wouldn't argue for a moment that hogan's heroes was a serious drama but it was the type of program that was much more common back in the 50s and 60s, which was a combination of comedy and believable drama, adventure. It was more like a comedy adventure. So the missions they had, they really didn't make fun of those. The fun of the comedy came from the character interaction, the mocking of the Germans, the, the, the mocking of the Nazis, and then some of the... Uh, just uh, obvious character interaction that takes place when you have uh, ensembles uh, put together. Uh, the one one of the uh, strong points of the series was 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 introduced from that very first episode, which was it was starring Bob Crane, who was all, all, always also immediately familiar because he had been a strong second banana over the years on programs like the Donna Reed show. So he had the lead and then, and it's co-starring the German side, Werner Kemp Klemperer and, and uh, John Banner. And that's where we start to get into a rich history for each of those uh, characters. And, um, and I, just to also, I want to point out what Wally said. I mean, granted, I was 12 years old when that film, when the TV series started. I loved it, watched it every week. But but in the, and I never for a minute was thinking this was a, this is a realistic portrayal of a POW camp. You didn't go into it expecting that. And you didn't do that for any shows like that. But it did in the early seasons, as I recall, um, did have, some elements of drama in it that you wouldn't get in a completely fluff sitcom like Bewitched, for example. Um, and and I liked that because it had a nice combination. Of course, the, the, the German characters were all straw men who were knocked down all the time over and over again. 
but the the drama of whether the you know the Hogan and his crew is going to succeed in their current operation is was was kind of real in many ways, and so it was exciting. It had that those dual elements that I enjoyed. And 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 one more uh, aspect about the how can you do all this uh, from a prisoner of war camp is that goes back to the um, the fact that in a war setting there were a lot of little things that were done throughout Europe, throughout throughout the war zone. It's like if you were the residents of a town and the invaders come in, I mean, we see this playing out now with it, with an invader from the East coming to the West. Uh, this is your town, you know it. And so you can undercut them in ways they don't even realize. Oh, just go left that way. Oh, you just Put them into a box canyon or what have you. So, in other words, it's not that unbelievable that people who were talented in the ways that the uh, POWs were talented in the Hogan's Heroes setting could really fool the Germans because, as I said, first the Germans came in officious and dumb. Uh, that's caricature Hollywood dumb. And besides that, the heroes were clever and talented. So it was very important, if you're looking through the cast, I mentioned Ver Werner Klemperer, uh, he said, the Germans can't win, the Nazis can't win. Klink, the character he's playing, cannot be a hero. He cannot triumph in any episode. And, and that's what Klemperer said to the producers of the, of the series, that is a condition to him taking the role. So the quote is, some. Uh, here's the quote, I had one qualification, he said later, when I took the job, if they ever wrote a segment whereby Colonel Klink would come out the hero, I would leave the show. There was no chance, the way they approached that storytelling, that Klink would be the hero. But what was, what worked about the series in particular is that there was this uneasy status quo that developed. Hogan and his crew needed the incompetent Clink and the incompetent Sergeant Schultz in power, because that's the way they were able to pull all this off. And so Clink didn't know how, but somehow he knew with the cooperation of Colonel Hogan that he had this perfect record, because that was the reputation almost playing with the assertion from uh, the Great Escape when they say, there will be no escapes from this camp and so Clink, the quintessential incompetent bureaucrat, proudly says throughout the series, there has never been an escape, a successful escape. You know, they recapture people if they disappear. There has never been a successful escape from Stalag 13 because Hogan and his team didn't want there to be one. And Clink needed that because that's what he could always hold up to, to whenever he was being criticized by any of the other Germans, the, his superiors, he could always say, look, I, I, there've been no escapes from my camp. So they were perhaps willing to just let it be. If, if he had this perfect record, they'll leave him alone. And that's, of course, what Klink wanted. He didn't want to go anywhere else. And we speak with affection of these characters because the actors really were good. Uh, the uh, the, I think one of the reasons that Hogan's Hero still plays today in reruns, uh, the, the six seasons worth of episodes, is that there is absolutely solid writing and solid performing. And we'd like to focus a little bit on, on a number of the, the cast members. I mentioned uh, Werner Klemperer a couple of times. He was born in Cologne, Germany. He was in a musical family. Uh, his uh, dad was uh, Otto Klemperer, a conductor. His mother was a soprano. Uh, the uh, they came, they immigrated to the U.S. in 1933, so they were ahead of what was going on. Uh, and, and of course, his his father was famously and well known as such. He was Jewish, it, it, exactly. And uh, it, he had established himself. Uh, Otto uh, Klemperer did. It's like, this is the uh, the profession that I'm proud of. We were a musical family, and we're proud of that. And what does my son want to do but go into acting? Well, luckily, uh, there was some music in there. 
And uh, his son was uh, learned how to play the violin, actually play it well. He was a pianist. One of the gags of Hogan's Heroes is that um, Colonel Klink is not a good violin player, but he is actually in real life, the performer. And in any case, uh, they are in the U.S., in Los Angeles, and uh, Werner decides to uh, pursue acting. But he also then, in the war years, served in World War II in the United States Army. So um, he joined the Special Services Unit. And this is a story we see a number of times. Uh, Harry alluded to uh, the likes of Howard Morris and, and, and other Jewish entertainers is they used their opportunity in war service, genuine war service, to perform. They would be part of the performing companies. And so they kind of cut their teeth uh, on that as well. And then he, but they uh, were going he, around. They were going around yeah. and, and visiting troops in active, you know, battle areas. So they um, essentially, when when uh, Klemper co comes comes back, uh, continues that uh, profession, and he has active uh, career uh, on stage and in uh, TV series, uh, movies, and such. It is. And he admitted it in many an interview that his defining role to the general public was as Colonel Klink. They know him for that. And more than one actor has said, I accept that. That's how people know me. And what's neat about uh, interviews with uh, Klemper that we, we, we saw is that uh, he was proud of the work he did. It was first class work and he was true to himself in terms of how the Nazi character he was playing was portrayed. Uh, he was not a winner. He was duped and he lost to the allies. But nonetheless, he was part of a, as I say, a relationship that worked in the TV fiction for everybody and for his own personal career. Um, he continued for, ma for many years. Uh, he he uh, died at the age of 80 in uh, Manhattan and uh, he was working till the very end. He even played on a voiceover in an episode of The Simpsons at the very end of his career. And one of the few times he did the Colonel Clint character after Hogan's Heroes. He also pointed out in one of the interviews that that he was very also proud of the little touches that he had added to the character that wasn't in the script. He added the monocle and the riding crop, which of course a you know more classically Prussian officer type of a background, and and that really is a nice. Those are two nice little touches that that showed Klemper as trying to be you know an upper class uh, uh, elite uh, German officer. Uh, the flip of that, of course, is the character played by John Banner, who is Sergeant Hans Schultz, uh, who uh, now Banner uh, also has, has an interesting career, uh, also Jewish. Uh, he was born in 1910 in what was then the Austro-Hungarian Empire, but is now Western Ukraine. He went to law school. How about that? Uh, to the University of Vienna, but he didn't finish and decided to go into acting instead. At the time, of course, of the 1938 Anschluss, when Germany absorbed Austria, uh, Banner had the good luck of having to be, it was being, he was in Switzerland at that time as part of a theatrical troupe. And clearly, he never went back to Austria. He emigrated to the U.S. and learned English. Um, unfortunately, most of his family that was still in Austria died in the camps. So he had a real personal connection with all of that. He enlisted in the US Army Air Corps in 42 and was a supply sergeant. Yes, he really was a sergeant. Um, and he did a lot of early television. He was a lot thinner in those days. Um, he appeared in Sky King, Superman, Father Knows Best and others. I, I never noticed him in those shows, which many of them I watched. Um, also interesting, uh, he popped up, he and Klemperer had two uh, acting roles together in earlier performances. In 1956, in an episode of the Alfred Hitchcock Presents, he and Klemperer both had small roles. 
And in the 1961 film Operation Eichmann, uh, he played Rudolf Hess to Werner Klemperer's Eichmann character. Um, one of the, the of course, it, the character of Sergeant Schultz in the Hogan's Heroes, the catchphrase that he was always known for by was, I know nothing, nothing. Again, Schultz, the last thing he wanted to do was to get involved in whatever it was that Hogan and his gang were doing. And so he would absolutely look away, close his eyes, and didn't want to know. And that became a punchline. No, I know nothing. Well, it turns out in looking through this, in the 1961 episode of The Untouchables, which, by the way, has Leonard Nimoy, pre-Mr. Spock, as a small character, Banner's character, who, of course, has a German accent, he always had that German accent, uh, is being grilled by some mobster. And Banner's character <laughs> says, I know nothing. I know nothing. So he he was he had a good good background for that line. Um, like Warner Klemper, Banner also defended his role. And in a 67 interview, uh, he said, you know, Schultz is not a Nazi. He said, I see Schultz as the representative of some kind of goodness in any generation. Um, uh, uh, Schultz was, was just happy to be serving out the war in the prisoner of war camp and not being sent to the Russian front. Now, uh, continuing down the list, there were, uh, these were not the marquee characters, but characters that were in a good number of episodes, uh, also uh, strong Nazi characters, uh, General Burkhalter, uh, played by uh, Leon Askin, and uh, he was uh, an Austrian Jew, um, and he had, unlike the Klemper's uh, family, uh, his family was in Vienna, and he didn't come to the uh, U.S. until 1940. And this was following some pretty rough times for himself, being beaten and abused uh, by the Nazi uh, Nazis. But even more tragic, his parents were uh, murdered in the Treblinka death camp. So he served in World War II as a staff sergeant, uh, coming over uh, to the uh, U.S. Armed Forces, and afterwards. Uh, went to Hollywood. And like John Banner, he uh, had an accent that was just part of his persona. Uh, he was uh, cast in, oh, easily 50 films or so. You, it was He would be one of those faces you would see. I know that face, uh, especially the, in the older films uh, where you, uh, the, the black and white uh, late 40s, uh, early 50s films where, where, where you'd go, why is that face familiar? And so mostly he could play without even trying the, instead of a German operative, it became a Soviet operative or just a mysterious nondescript, doesn't matter what country it is. He is that suspicious character off on the side, but he had a uh, successful run uh, in playing those character roles and he lived till 97 and he uh, died of natural causes in uh, Vienna. Uh, coming full circle. Uh, another uh, supporting uh, character, Major Huckstetter, uh, would uh, depart from all of these in that he was born in the U.S. He was from Nashville, Tennessee, yeah, but a Jewish family. And uh, at 13, um, he uh, and his family, uh, because it was uh, under the name of Cohen, uh, moved to New York City. And so he started studying acting, and he learned how to be a superb mimic. Uh, he, as it says in one of these uh, profiles of him, he suppressed his Southern accent. I mean, I guess when you start in Nashville, you're going to have a Southern accent that you're either going to make your character or learn how to put aside. And so he sort of did both. And he was able to do multiple roles. He was in uh, the, the, the statistic I came across was 750 live and filmed TV uh, roles. And he was, again, another German officer. He was a Gestapo uh, officer. But he, too, like um, uh, Burkhalter and like Klink, 
would be easily or craftily uh, outwitted by Hogan and again, consistently fooled for his own career advancement, for his own personal safety, uh, he would let them get away with it because trying to figure this out was more trouble than it was worth. And so the character of uh, Hochstetter was there throughout the series. Actually, he started uh, in a different character, like two episodes, and then they gave him his own uh, reoccurring character. And uh, basically, uh, this was part of that group that said, we're going to go with the program. The Nazis, as portrayed in Hogan's Heroes, are not the ones in charge. And they're not in charge because they lack heart, they lack soul, and they don't have the chutzpah of the prisoner of war circle. So if Howard Kane was, shall we say, took the safest route, Harry, someone else had a much closer to home real life experience. Yeah, we would talk, we've been talking about the German characters in Hogan's Heroes, the one and only member of the main cast of Hogan's Heroes who had a direct personal connection with uh, the Nazis uh, was Robert Clary. He played uh, one of the Allied so soldiers, the Free French Air Force Corporal Louis Lebeau. Uh, Clary was Jewish, also born in Paris, 1926, as Robert Weiderman, son of uh, Polish Jewish immigrants. He was the youngest of 14 children. Uh, his both parents and 10 of his siblings died in the camps. Um, he began singing professionally in Paris in 1938 at the age of 12. Because he was living in Nazi-occupied France, he was arrested in 42 and sent to one of the concentration camps in Upper Silesia and got, you know, the tattoo, A5714 on his left forearm, which he had for the rest of his life, of course, and later was sent to Buchenwald. Um, he managed to survive uh, the camps uh, after, you know, obviously a very, very difficult time and was liberated with the other prisoners at that point uh, in April of 45. In a, 19, in a 2015 interview, uh, Clary said, you know, sometimes I dream about those days. I wake up in a sweat, terrified for fear that I'm going to be sent away to a concentration camp again. But I don't hold a grudge because that's a great waste of time. Yeah, there's something really dark in the human soul. And for the most part, human beings are not very nice. And that's why when you find those who are, you should cherish them. So after the war, he returns to Paris, starts singing, resumes his singing career and starts recording. Uh, some of those recordings got to the attention of Capitol Records in the US and they got released over here. So he moves to the US in 1949 and begins appearing on early TV and movies. He got to know Eddie Cantor and his daughter, Natalie. And as a matter of fact, uh, Clary winds up marrying Natalie Cantor a little bit later. Um, he had no problems taking the part of LeBeau. Uh, in that same 2015 interview I mentioned, he said, I, I never put myself as LeBeau as me, Robert Clary, never. It was very different. Stalag 13, the camp in the TV show, is not a concentration camp. It's a POW camp, and there's a world of difference. It was a part that I did, and we have we actors have to play all kinds of parts. If I have to play a German, I'll play a German. If I have to play something else, and I feel it's a good part, I'll do it. That's why we're actors. Um, after Hogan's Hero, Clary probably had more success than any of the other main characters, but mostly in soap operas. He was in Days of Our Lives uh, and NBC playing a fictional Holocaust survivor, as well as on CBS, The Young and the Restless and The Bold and the Beautiful. He just died this past November at age 96, and he was the last surviving original main actor of Hogan's Heroes, and that's kind of what was the instigation of doing this this program here today because now now they're all gone and 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 so he he had he had the most connection and he he knew what he was talking about in terms of of the situation that that was going on one of the questions that we inevitably get is yes this is successful in reruns 
yes, this is successful as a familiar property. Could you do it now? Could somebody come in with the pitch? Uh, we'd like to do Hogan's Heroes. About 10 years ago, um, after a multi-year legal battle, um, Harriet mentioned Albert Ruddy and Bernard, uh, Bernard Fine, they won back the ownership of their creative property um, from the uh, Bing Crosby Productions and its successor owners and such. And that was 10 years ago that said, well, we're going to do something with this. I'm still waiting. I, I don't know if it was COVID or what, but I'd love to see how they try to do it because, quote, they uh, are, want to use, develop a feature film ensemble comedy using the show's clever World War II German POW camp premise uh, with the rights that include movies, publication, merchandising, radio, TV sequel, etc. We'll see. It's it's a tough nut to crack now because you don't have the context that we had set uh, from the 50s into the 60s for the original Hogan's Heroes. One of the other things that I was just interested in while we were doing this research was I started thinking, I mean, none of the POWs in Hogan's Heroes is portrayed as Jewish. Uh, Lebeau even is not, he's just French. They don't never discuss his religion. And I was wondering how were real life Jewish POWs treated in POW camps in Nazi Germany during World War II? And I found a fascinating uh, academic article, which in a complete nutshell, uh, says that interestingly enough, in general, in general, I mean, yes, the Jewish POWs suffered discrimination and harassment from the Germans, of course. But in general, on the whole, the Jewish POWs were treated as per the Geneva Convention. Uh, if they were from the Western Allies, apparently there was a big difference between how the Nazis treated the POWs from France, Britain, the US, and how they treated the POWs from Russia and from Eastern Europe, either Jewish or non-Jewish. Uh, the, 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 the Eastern POWs did not have a good time in, in Nazi control. But the funny thing was, they said that for at least for the Western soldiers, that a German, if you were Jewish, a German POW camp was just about the safest place for Jews in Nazi occupied Europe in real life. And I believe I alluded to how do we know Hogan's Heroes was a comedy? Well, Mel Brooks would say Stalag 13 is funny. But Mel Brooks has also taken that road himself. I, I mentioned that um, taking directly taking on Nazi control in film, on stage, on TV, goes way back to the warriors themselves. I mean, Jack Benny famously has to have and have not. Jack Benny, Jewish Jack Benny. And Mel Brooks later remade uh, to have and, and have not. And I believe, Harry, you have something about one of Mel Brooks's other projects. Well, yes. I mean, of course, uh, Mel Brooks was the force behind The Producers, uh, which was a film that came out in 67, two years after Hogan's Hero started, which really took the let's make fun of the Nazis and ran with it. Um, clearly, The Producers is a much better, funnier and you know better product than Hogan's Heroes. But but anyway, and within that film, of course, there's the play within the film called Springtime for Hitler, which it's a hilarious film. Um, Brooks served in the U.S. Army during World War II and saw action at the Battle of the Bulge. And he was asked in 1978 about the idea of making fun of Nazis. And he said, he said, well, you know, the Holocaust by the Nazis was the greatest outrage of the 20th century. There's nothing to compare to it. So what can I, Mel Brooks, what can I do about it? If I get up on a soapbox and wax eloquently, it'll be blown away in the wind. But if I do springtime for Hitler, it'll never be forgotten. I think you can bring down totalitarian governments faster by using ridicule than you can with invective. And to me, that kind of summarizes everything that's going on in Hogan's Heroes. Again, Hogan's Heroes is no the producers, but that's the idea. That's why so many of the Jews were involved in the production of it. It's making fun of the Nazis, which is 
the most success they could have. They're gone. Nazis are gone. Those actors are still there. And that wraps up our overview of Hogan's Heroes. Be happy to hear any of your questions, observations, and so forth. Great. Thank you both so much. Lots and lots of questions. Um, the first, though, I wanted to say uh, we had a Zoom in our last week with comedian Judy Gold, and this topic of humor in the Holocaust came up. And she uh, showed us a book she had on her bookshelf uh, called It Kept Us Alive, Humor in the Holocaust by Chaya Ostrauer. So I'll, I'll send that to everybody if they're interested, but um, there's a whole book about that that topic. Okay, so um, I'm going to try and com combine a few questions so we can get to quite a few. Um, since it was only 20 years past the war, do you think that the show could have happened if it wasn't created, produced, directed, starred in by Jews, as if the Jews were giving their blessings to do the show? Um, that wasn't that wasn't prominently featured. I, again, I was 12 years old, but at the time, I didn't know anything about these actors being Jewish. I knew nothing about it and it hadn't didn't have any impact on me. Only years, years, decades later when I discovered that, it made an impact on me and I started thinking exactly that is that it's by having in effect the seal of approval from the people, the Jews behind the scenes and in front of the camera, I think that probably was a, was a help. And what also helped again was that uh, going through William Paley's eyes, CBS head, Jewish, uh, was that it was a big hit. That is, it was, it was, it potentially could be a successful TV series uh, because it had, that territory had already been trod recently um, with uh, the Stalag uh, 17 and, and with the Great Escape. So, um, and, you, know, you know, actually there was some controversy, not because of the Jewish aspect, but because at that time, the U.S. was in the midst of the Vietnam War. And so one of the critical pieces I, I came across was just, is this appropriate while we have our soldiers out in Vietnam potentially being prisoners of war? It's not fun and games. Uh, that was a very much minority opinion. But the fact of the matter is there was some pause but ultimately, the conclusion was it's entertainment. Mm -hmm. And was there any um, pushback from the greater established Jewish community like the ADL, someone wants to know? I, I never heard of anything uh, along those lines. Um, again, uh, you know, at the time, it, it, was, it, it was just a sitcom. And, and it, it's not like it was a, a giant hit like All in the Family would be in a couple of years, which did create some backlash but i i never i mean people just weren't taking it particularly seriously that's a simple fact of the matter mm -hmm. and, and actually hogan's heroes it peaked in terms of rating success in its first season yep. did okay second and by the time it was in season number six it didn't even make the top 30 uh, uh programs mm -hmm. uh, somebody wants to know if if through your research, did you come about anything about um, Larry Crane, who was murdered, if you knew oh, anything ever got Bob resolved Crane, with that? Bob Crane. Bob Crane, I'm sorry, Bob Crane, yes. That's that's uh, worthy of an entire other episode. That's been a Hollywood mystery for decades. So I think he died in, what was it, Wally, in the early 70s, mid 70s? Yeah. And, and the first time I, I was in Hollywood working uh, for a, a political campaign, I'm walking down the um, the streets of uh, of Hollywood, and they have one of those uh, free papers, and latest on the Bob Crane mystery, and this was like in 76, yeah. so it was one of those unsolved mysteries that just bedeviled. And there, there's been a lot of conspiracy theories and all kinds of strange concepts of what was going on, and I, I'm not even going to get into that. I don't know, and I don't think... It, people in general, I don't think the truth that people really know. They just don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, do you know anything about the female characters that were on mm -hmm. the show? I do know that, of course, I had a crush on, on Fraulein Helga. I mean, I got to admit that. Uh, it turns out uh, that, that Fraulein Helga, I think it was that they actually changed the actress uh, after the first season, I think. Yeah. But the actress who played Fraulein Helga during most of the series wound up marrying Bob Crane. 
So lucky him. Oh. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, some folks want to know what uh, what is next for the two of you. Uh, <laughs> oh, really? We're well, having dinner in about an hour. Uh, <laughs> Well, one of the things that we've come to appreciate, uh, especially over the past couple of years with uh, opportunities to have conversations like that, like this with the uh, with your moment uh, webinars, is uh, it's time to continue the story. We're very proud of the uh, book that uh, we've done uh, currently in its third edition. It's gone from watching TV, four decades of American television, to six decades of American television, to eight decades of American television, and no promises for a, a firm publication date, but we're looking towards the uh, end of 2024 for 10 decades of American television. Great, thank you. And, and lastly, someone, a few people wrote in and said that the movie uh, they think you were talking about was to be or not to be. Oh, to be, you're right. I'm sorry. I just I, wanted I, to, to were, get that. That is correct. I, I knew when I said, wait, I think I've just gotten Humphrey Bogart confused with Jack Benny, which might make me the only person in the world other than Jack Benny who would make that mistake. Uh, and also just to note that a lot of people uh, have written thinking that today a show like this would not be possible in today's I, culture. I would tend to agree, honestly. I don't, there's there's yeah. a lot of shows that were popular, successful, big shows in the past. I mean, I, for example, I just mentioned All in the Family. Honestly, I don't think you could do All in the Family today, mm -hmm. even though it was a tremendous show and a groundbreaking show and did a lot of good work and was very funny. But I don't think you could get that on the air today. Mm -hmm. And then just lastly, and then we are going to have to go, but uh, several people wrote in um, saying that Nita Talbot was on the show as a Russian agent and she was Jewish too. Oh, uh, I'm sure if, once you start going into the uh, guest cast, yes, you, you can have a, a long checklist. Yes. of uh, folks with uh, that heritage. So, uh, and finally, uh, I know people are probably curious where you can watch it. Uh, it's not streaming anywhere, uh, as we discovered, uh, but apparently the sixth season is on, what was the name of the network, Carrie, that you- MeTV. 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 So if you, you have a cable or, or you look it up on the web, you'll be able to see where you can see MeTV. And it's currently, I believe, at 10 o'clock and 1030 uh, on Eastern. weeknights. Eastern. Eastern, yes. So anyway- <laughs> And also the entire series is available on DVD. Yes. Since yeah, you had raised that it. question, I started looking, well, how can, how can Susan find it? Yeah. All right. Well, Walter, Wally, and uh, Harry, thank you so much for this fabulous presentation. We look forward to another one in the future on another topic. And thank you, everybody, for joining us. Please go to our website, momentmag.com, where you can register for next week's program about Jewish history through musical plays and theaters with Hershey Felder. Uh, I will be sending out a link with the recording, as well as uh, some of the other films that Wally and Harry uh, listed. Again, thanks everybody, and we'll see you next time. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.